This week's episode is made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com. Good morning, Memphis. You're listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WYXR Radio 91.7 FM. Meanwhile in Memphis is a program dedicated to conversations that celebrate the organizations, initiatives, and people that are shaping Memphis for the better. Meanwhile in Memphis is brought to you by New Memphis, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop, activate, and retain the city's most important resource, its people. Your hosts today are me, Rebecca Daly, and Anna Thompson. We are very excited that tonight, tonight is the night for Teacher's Lounge. It will be held at Good Fortune and... We will be covering the topic of AI in the classroom with Executive Director of Code Crew and recent podcast guest, Meka Agwekwe. This event is open to all educators, and it is free, and there will be drinks and food. So really, be there or be square, educators, tonight at Good Fortune. Head to newmemphis.org slash events to register. Also coming up on Tuesday, November 8th is Celebrate What's Right, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. This panel discussion moderated by Mayor-elect Paul Young will feature a panel of leaders who are creating impactful change through community safety. You can learn more about both of these events at newmemphis.org slash events and get your free tickets. Today, we are discussing how to create success for all members of our community by discussing our shared humanity specifically related to the reentry process. In order for our city to be livable and lovable for any of us, it has to be livable and lovable for all of us. This touches on, but is not limited to, access to resources for economic mobility, human rights, and trust in the governing systems. Today's conversation was actually sparked in 2021 after uh, a conversation on the TEDx Memphis stage with Dr. William Fry Arnold and followed up by a conversation on this podcast in 2022 to help us better understand the state level of the reentry process. And today we're continuing that conversation to take a look a little more locally, um, not only at the reentry process, but around how building empathy can help us build a better and brighter community and by investing in our neighbors holistically, but specifically our neighbors who are coming back into the community after a period of incarceration. To help us understand this topic better, we've invited DeAndre Brown Sr. and Virginia Murphy to the studio. DeAndre Brown is the founder of Lifeline to Success and the director of Shelby County's Office of Reentry. DeAndre's work in reentry began when he founded Lifeline to Success in 2009. He found his own reentry after a 25 months in state and federal prison to be exceedingly difficult and cluttered with obstacles. Instead of complaining about the problem, DeAndre and his wife Vanessa decided to begin an organization dedicated solely to streamlining the reentry process and advocating for justice. DeAndre Brown was appointed by Shelby County Mayor Lee Harris to serve as the director of the Shelby County Office of Reentry in August 2021. DeAndre and his wife Vanessa have eight children and two grandchildren. He is also the pastor of Lifeline to a Dying World Ministries. Also joining us today is Virginia Reed Murphy, who is the executive director and founder of Playback Memphis. Virginia holds a master's in counseling psychology with a concentration in drama therapy and is a skilled facilitator delivering dynamic training in cultural humility, strengths-based mindfulness, and emotional intelligence for leadership. Let's bring our guests into the studio. Welcome, Virginia and DeAndre. How are y'all this morning? I'm amazing. Ah, Good. I'm happy to be here. Good. We're so glad to have y'all. Um, we want to get started by having each of you share a little bit about yourselves and your respective organizations. So, Virginia, you can go first. Yeah. Uh, I'm Virginia Murphy, and I am the founder and director of Playback Memphis. I am a native Memphian, a graduate of St. Mary's High School, and uh, went on uh, from Memphis to uh the East Coast for college and West Coast for graduate school. So I have a background, um, I have a master's in counseling psychology uh, with a concentration in drama therapy. And that's actually where I was introduced to playback theater, Um, was a part of a playback theater company in New York City um, for about five years. And then when my husband and I decided to 
return to Memphis after we had our first child and wanted to be closer to family. Um, I wanted to bring uh, playback theater, which uh, is a form of improvisational uh, story sharing and witnessing theater um, that is uh, at its heart a tool for peace building and helping people cross difficult divides and kind of connect to themselves and one another uh, through sharing their stories and um, connecting to our shared humanity and our unique differences. Um, I wanted to, if I was going to return to Memphis, you know, I I had an awareness that Memphis um, sits on a very entrenched history of pain uh, and that I wanted uh, to be a part of uh, change and healing. And I felt like that playback could be a powerful tool for that. And so Playback Memphis was founded. We're celebrating our 15th year anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very grateful to have grown this work in the city that I love and to have partnered with um, folks like DeAndre and Lifeline to Success. And so, yeah, that's a little bit of, of Playback. Well, that's a, that's and a perfect segue into <laughs> our next guest. DeAndre, can you introduce us to your background and your organization, Lifeline to Success, and its mission? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is DeAndre Brown, and I am a convicted felon. Uh, I, I serve now humbly as the director for the Shelby County Office of Reentry. Prior to that, I was the f- I am the founder, former executive director of an organization, Lifeline to Success. Uh, we are an organization of convicted felons that decided that we wanted to change the perception of what it was to be a person that a felony with a felony conviction. Because generally, uh, when you see a story about a person that's com- com- committed a felony, or you see a person that's committed a heinous crime, when a person is attempting to reenter society, that's where the mindset goes of a person that's not justice involved. The worst person they see on the television last night has to be just like the person that they're interacting with today or have an interview with tomorrow. So we wanted to change that, remove the stigma so people knew we were just people. Well, we've made bad decisions, but we've done things to rectify them. Uh, one of the things I caution when I give converse, when I have conversations is when people want to serve the justice-involved population, they need to make sure that there's a vetting process first mm-hmm. because everyone that has made bad decisions has not decided that they want to make good decisions. And if you just have a blanket policy of attempting to figure that out on your own when you don't understand the culture, you can put yourself in position to become a victim while you're attempting to help. I don't mean a victim while they rob you or take something from you, but they begin to play on your kindness and victimize you in a way that you're amenable to and feel good about it after it's over. But you have not done anything to assist that person in becoming a better human being or a positive, productive citizen. So for the past 14 years, Lifeline's anniversary was last week. Ooh, congratulations been, to you, thank too. You, thank you. We've been servicing individuals that are convicted felons. We, we don't service anyone other than that specific population intentionally because we want to make sure that when we do this, and, and one of the reasons we started it, when people, when I found out that this work was actually happening in America, I wanted to have a group of people that came from different backgrounds that had no affiliation other than the fact that they had a record. Because when you bring a group of people together, like a test case that you don't vet first and you prove to the public that they can work together as a team, you've pretty much solved the problem of trying to see them as different people. But (laughs) we had to do that intentionally, bringing people in that don't come from the same place, different gang affiliations, different educational levels, different levels of of, uh, ability, some even mentally unstable that needed medication. You put all those people in one room, give them equipment and send them out to clean up our neighborhood after being trained in class every day. And I tell you, it's been a blessing. That's awesome. I love how you were like, well, the um, like part of the scientific experiment, if you will, was like going to be the solution if it worked. And there you have it. And I didn't tell you about my education. I apologize because you said scientific. Uh, I'm an alum of, of Rose College. I did not graduate because they were selling d- uh, drugs next door to my mom. Uh, that's how I became <laughs> involved in the criminal activity. So uh, I, came, I became so good at it. Uh, they were selling crack next door to my mom's house, and uh, I didn't, I couldn't afford to come to school every day because I didn't feel comfortable on campus. Uh, so since I didn't feel comfortable in that environment, I would run home every day to be comforted, but mm. I couldn't get back. And I realized that there was an opportunity to make money selling drugs, but I was not a drug dealer. I was on my way to become a doctor, a neonatal neurosurgeon. Mm. 
Uh, that was my goal. And I was on my way. But then life happened. Mm-hmm. And I made some bad decisions. And I, I did what I was supposed to do. I, I rectified it through the government's uh, way of rectifying and done my time. And now I've, become, I've been out now attempting to make sure other people don't have to take that path. So interesting. Yeah. So, DeAndre, you mentioned that uh, you serve in the Office of Reentry. Can you can we get back to basics and talk about what is reentry? What is that process? Why do we have an office dedicated in our local government? That's a great question. So prison kills a part of you. Uh, you have to create a whole new person to survive. The person that goes in is never the person that comes out. Some come out better. The majority come out worse because you have to understand that it's its own world and there is no sense of protection. Uh, you're always at a heightened state always at a heightened state. I have to sleep at, with the lights on at home. I can't sleep with the lights off. I have to have the television on. I can't go to sleep in public places. I can't lay on the beach and go to sleep. I can't sit on my patio and close my eyes for more than three seconds because I jump up. I've been out of prison for almost 20 years and it never goes away. So when I came home from prison in 2005, I wanted to go back. I started preaching while I was in prison. I wanted to go back and preach. I ran into a group called Prison Fellowship who said, well, we're not really preaching now. We're doing this new thing called reentry. Uh, like, what is that? So they trained me on what reentry was. I said, you know, I want to do that too. We went inside Mark Luttrell, which at the time was a women's facility, and started training women who are incarcerated on how to come home as healthy, heal people. At the same time, we found that our organization on the outside to help anyone that was justice involved, felony conviction, to become healthy, heal people. Knowing that since I, I, I made bad decisions on purpose, I knew how to help un- other individuals back that out and go back to being the person that God created initially. And so reentry is, in my opinion, is the totality of services and opportunities necessary for an individual to become a positive, productive citizen. And that encompasses everything. The, the problem I see when people attempt to do reentry is they try to focus on one thing. You, mm. Reentry is about a human. It's not about a system. It's not about a behavior. It's about a human reclaiming humanity. And if you take, if, if, if you try to use a narrow uh, focus and attempt to get them a job, somewhere to live, some, something to drive, while it's fine, it could meet a need for that moment, but you haven't re- re- removed the mindset that made a person do it in the first place. I believe the easiest way to reduce crime is to change the behavior of a criminal. I want criminals to come to me actively involved in crime, and I can help them reenter society because I know what made them do it in the first place. So can you share a little bit, Virginia, about how the work at Playback kind of intersects right here in the reclaiming that shared human experience and being able to kind of work through some of that why to be able to reframe some of those experiences? Yeah. yeah. Playback Theater, uh, at our core, Playback Memphis, we are a performance ensemble. So we uh, perform a special kind of improvisational story sharing and witnessing theater And if you were to attend a performance, you would see on the stage uh, actors, musicians, dancers, and an audience. Um, We come across many diverse identities, and uh, and also our audiences are incredibly diverse. Um, And the invitation at our performances is to uh, reflect and share uh, moments from your life, true stories from your life. And then this trained team of actors listens. And the way that the actors um, are trained is to listen with a really deep level of empathy. So they're always listening to um, not only what the person is sharing on the surface of the story, but really what are the feelings and needs of the human being. And some of those stories that are shared are very lighthearted. And one of the things that we love in playback is that it touches a lot of um, joy. Uh, But also, uh, we're not doing our deepest best work, um, unless people come and share, um, you know, some of the more difficult, painful stories. So we have a public performance series called Memphis Matters, where we're inviting ourselves to reflect on what's rich and wonderful in our shared community, as well as what is sometimes complex and painful. So it's an arts experience, but I also uh, like people to understand that it's really a deep learning experience, and it's a place um, where we're really inviting people to reconnect to their humanity because we believe that, you know, we live in 
a culture where we are kind of conditioned to judge and shame and blame and be siloed away in our socio-political, uh, you know, divisive little camps. And um, and we've never lived in a time that's more dehumanizing than the world that we live in now. And uh, so the, the, the art form is intended for that. We apply it, though, in... Um, in specific ways to support in introducing the principles and practices of nonviolent com- communication, cultural humility, strength-based mindfulness, um, essentially, you know, tools that uh, that any human being can benefit from. But particularly if you are a human being that has um, either in your own life and story survived complex trauma or perhaps you are, you know, working a frontline worker where, you know, you are responsible for the care of human beings who have survived complex trauma. Um, really knowing how to calm and steady one's mind, how to operate from, you know, just a place of awareness and empathy and um, and connection and uh, is is something that you know we all benefit from. So uh, when when playback was very early in its development, uh, we were invited to be part of a community police relations building project that at the time was spearheaded by another uh, organization. And um, this work happened over a period of three years and, there were some really amazing things that happened. Good seeds were planted. We had used playback in an effective and helpful way, and we wanted to continue this work. And I think I saw um, a production that uh, Elaine Blanchard had done some prison stories work with Lifeline mm-hmm. uh, folks. And I went to a performance at a church in Frazier, and I can't remember what church it was. Union Grove Baptist Church. Thank you. <laughs> And I remember sitting in the audience and listening to the stories and seeing you in the in the back with the slew of kiddos that you and Miss Brown have. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I just had this vision. I was I just thought, oh, we must partner like this is this, you know, we're meant to do work together. And so I approached DeAndre and uh, I don't know. Do you remember that conversation? I don't. I said yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I like. I got like four words out. He's like, yes, yeah. yes. And that was. Um, and so in 2014, we launched Performing the Peace, which is a program that brought together. Um, yes, it brought together. Um, I think it was seven participants from Lifeline to Success, so seven individuals with justice histories and seven uh, law enforcement officers from the Memphis Police Department. So the structure of that was that, you know, we we would introduce um, playback in separate uh, groups because you mm-hmm. wouldn't mix those those um, identities initially. Um, and, uh, and, and they would have four sessions in which, um, you know, we would introduce playback as a place, a space of exploration. And, um, and then they would come together and meet each other, um, through the, 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 the playback theater. And, um, and we had, I think, five years of doing this work, um, had it evaluated, um, by Dr. Robert Niemeyer at the University of Memphis, really saw that it was having a deep impact on a small scale, meaning that, you know, we're in our work, we are always aspiring uh, to catalyze um, growth and and healing on three levels. So we want people to um, do the inner work of personal responsibility to grow their own self-awareness and um, build... um, you know, they're also their capacity for being aware of, of, of others and perspective taking and, you know, being able to identify and express their feelings and police officers and formerly incarcerated individuals actually, you know, uh, it, and you want mayor, you can chime in if you agree or disagree, but I, I think they're, they have a lot of similar similarities and that they mm-hmm. have, um, you know, been steeped in culture that not only does not allow them 
you know, to express their feelings. It's not even safe to have feelings. Mm -hmm. And so part of the work is really to create a space where, you know, it's okay to um, be a person that has a feeling and to express that. And so as they become kind of, you know, sometimes it takes being, be recognizing someone else's humanity before you can actually connect with your own. And, um, and so after uh, the two groups come together, then they work together for six sessions and we train them in the art of playback theater. And, um, and that's kind of how the process worked for those many years. And now it's that we've done a lot of work where the individuals who were transformed by the program are now leading work in, um, in, in other ways. But it's a <laughs> space where it's, it is, there is psychological, there is a high level of psychological safety in the practice of playback theater. And, um, and I think particularly when people have survived complex trauma, one of the things that trauma does is it shuts down the imagination and, uh, and, and playback because so much of the, the practice is rooted actually in play. It ignites the imagination mm -hmm. and it kind of helps people to see possibilities where um, because of literally the way that trauma affects your brain, it, you're just cut off from from imagining different possibilities, and so that's one of the things that I that I do think is um, it, it, we we absolutely use playback as a way to introduce trauma informed awareness and care, and um, yes, in the spirit of play, I think mm -hmm. is a really healing force within it. And I believe it also it reactivates neural pathways that have been shut off. That's the the medical analysis uh, the neural pathways are reignited and it lights them up in the brain so you can create new paths i found this out from one of my doctor friends creates new neural pathways that are that make the trauma that cause the synapses to stop stop going too far but it, it causes the brain to function better than it did before you catalyzed it yeah and and there's no question that it that it does that mm -hmm. yeah and it sounds like playback is really focused on the internal barriers that we have, whether or not we're in control of them. Um, and so working to break down some of those barriers and create new pathways in our brains and lifeline to success, you're helping folks deal with external barriers as well as internal barriers. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to understand what some of the barriers are to reentry. When you consider the fact that the nation's laws were created to ensure that once a person had a felony conviction, they become an, they became an outcast. They were not going to be a part of society. I think when initially the thought was never what happens next. It's let's punish, let's ostracize, let's show them to not do it again. Let's make it so difficult for them that they won't consider breaking the law again. And then over years, collateral consequences have just, just, been, just been added. My point is the society had, had overreacted in such a way that once a person has a felony conviction and the term they use now, you're infamous. Once you become an infamous person, then life is supposed to pretty much be over. But but we never really took into consideration, well, what does that person now do? So when you're in rural America, you, you can leave and they can do whatever and they can figure it out. But in an urban environment, what happens to that person? They still have to eat. They still, they still need their needs met. So how do they meet their needs? So what we do is we'll just say they'll do it again. We'll build more space. So we'll just keep them away from you forever. Problem is not it costs too much. So when you when you consider the when you look at, at consequences, i.e., you can't get certain professional licenses, you can't own a weapon, you can't live in certain places. Life that a normal person takes for granted is removed uh, as an option for a person with a felony conviction, and you pretty much have to just figure it out. In mo in most cases, people just say forget it get on drugs or go back to prison and spend their time perpetually going back into the system because it's become normalized and it's easy. It's very difficult to reenter society in America. It is damn near impossible without a lot of support and a backbone. And since that's the way it's set up, it takes people like Virginia assisting individuals that have a desire and giving them opportunity to then flourish knowing one thing, Failure is part of recovery. Mm -hmm. But see, in, in America, failure means you go back to prison. 
but that doesn't help society. Mm -hmm. But it makes them feel better. It makes them feel safer. But if you look at the news or you check any statistics, you find out that while we've incarcerated more people per capita than any industrialized nation, our crime rate has not declined. So somebody has some bad information. Could you help us understand what the rates of recidivism are locally? It depends on what you classify as recidivism. This is why it's so convoluted. Some people call a rearrest recidivism. Some people oh. call a new charge recidivism. Some people call a new conviction recidivism. So th the numbers vary between 45 and 65 percent of people that come home return, depending on how you classify it. Mm -hmm. But I, I like to say it the other way. That means 35 to 65 percent of people don't go back. So I love that reframe. I know I do love that reframe too. So much of what we've talked about with other individuals, no matter the sector, is about how important language and things like that are. And before we actually um, got on the mics today, you were sharing something about um, neighbors. Can you share that again for us? Yeah. So we have to ask ourselves as a society: Do we want to continue to punish people, or do we want to regain our neighbor? Because ninety-five percent of the people that are behind bars now will come home. And generally, when I hear that stated, people say they will be your neighbor. And they're saying it as a form of fear. You know, oh. you do them better because they're coming home and they'll be living beside you. They'll be in the store with you. And it's like, oh, my God, I need to help them. As opposed to, no, they'll be ne your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice to have a neighbor that you could have a bite to eat with? Wouldn't mm -hmm. it be nice to be able to have a neighbor you could invite over for barbecue? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and they may have been in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not I'm afraid of that person, but I want to assist that person because many people in my, in my situation know that we come to relationships and people are afraid. So we, and, and one of the things about uh, poor people, poor people's relationships are based on what people do for them. And if you do something for me in my worst moment when no one else would, I owe you for the rest of my life. That's just how it operates. It's, it's unspoken. We understand it. That's why a lot of my people are resistant for help because they know in their mind they owe this person forever. So they won't receive help. They'll just suffer. So knowing that if you were to be nice to me when I come home, guess what? You've got a good neighbor. One of the best neighbors you'll ever find because I owe you for the rest of my life. So something that you've you've talked about um, reentry, what it means and what it can kind of look like, as well as different rates of recidivism. But something that I found in my own research and in talking to Dr. William Arnold, who is over the Tennessee Office of Reentry, is that it, like you mentioned, it's a very convoluted process. And so up until maybe a handful of years ago, there wasn't an office of reentry that was separate from the Department of Justice, correct? That is correct. And that was, if correct me if I'm wrong, a huge barrier for reentry because why would anybody want to go back to the department that did them wrong in whatever instance this is for help? Yes. And I will say this. So my office is where I believe nine years old now. We are under the Division of Correction. Okay. But the beautiful part about it is our mindset is while we are under the Division of Correction, we don't have practices that are Division of Correction practices. We are an entity that is completely separate. We do go in and, and provide services. But our, all, our job now is to be a place of compassion, mm -hmm. the house of redemption. So when people come into our office, when they pull on our door, we, we even change the layout. So when you come into our office, uh, there is a table with chairs, with flowers. It's inviting place. We we shifted, and but prior to my arrival at the office of reentry, parole intake. So anyone coming home from prison, anywhere in the state of Tennessee that's on parole, would have to go to a parole office. And if you ever been to a parole office, that's not a place you want to go as soon as you come home from prison because it feels like you're still in prison. So I sh I, I work with the Department of Correction, Tennessee Department of Correction, and our office is now the place where people come every Friday when they're coming home, no matter where they are in Tennessee. They have to do intake at our office. So we have a big sign on the back of the wall that says, welcome home. Uh, we treat them with dignity, honor, and respect. We smile when we see them. They feel like they they matter. I matter. And and moving forward, we pray that their reentry process is a lot smoother because they do get to find out what our services are as soon as they come home. Mm -hmm. So now they can make a decision, do I want help or not? Because to be honest with you, some people don't want help. The harsh reality is some people will go back to prison mm -hmm. because they want to. Uh, and and we have to make sure we focus on those. The majority of our focus is on individuals that want to do what's right and then have opportunity for those when they get it together to be ready because we cannot fight both of those fights effectively at the same time. How can, um, you mentioned a few of the different barriers to the reentry process, but we're speaking right now about those who want the help. Mm -hmm. How can 
Memphians be better neighbors to individuals who are reentering society to help them break down those barriers and treat them with respect and humanity that they deserve to be fully integrated members of society. One of the ways that I challenge people is if you're in a position that you have decisions to make that would allow an individual an opportunity that they would not otherwise be afforded uh, and, and the proper vetting has taken place mm-hmm. and this individual is ready to then take a chance. See, most of the time we will say, yes, I want this to happen. And yes, I want this to happen. Have the, the ability to make it happen. But we just still don't pull the trigger. Uh, I, well, I'm, I'm a hiring manager and I have the ability to hire people that I want to hire. But yet I still have a bias that I don't really uh, want to reveal. Or I, I have homes that I'm, I'm, I'm going to rent. And while I say I want to help people that are coming home from prison, I really don't want them in my house. Or I know a person's been in prison and they're going to be a neighbor. No, I'm a, I'm a city council protest. I don't want them. Not not my neighbor. Not in my neighbor. Somebody's neighbor, not Indeed. mine. Indeed. <laughs> and so it, the, the, the biggest thing that a human being can do, a Memphian can do, is to com- treat everybody in Memphis with compassion. Uh, that goes so far. It seems so simple. Speak to people when you walk by them in the grocery store. While that may seem like it's crazy, if you don't want to be robbed, speak to the guy standing outside that's asking for change. You don't have to give him change. Just speak because he sees you see him. He knows you see him. People rob you because you don't see them. You don't treat them as valid. You don't give them humanity. When you, when you tr- <laughs> you're so funny. I remember one time I was walking. I'm sorry. I spoke to this guy. I said, good morning. He said, you talking to me? You're the only person out here. <laughs> it's like, yes, I'm talking to you. Everybody's walked by him but me. And he's brightening his day. But small things like that go a long way. Virginia, yeah. we, oh, go oh, ahead. Can I, can I yes. actually respond yeah, to that? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of this as it relates to, and you talk about, you know, taking a chance on people. And, I, and I, I, I know there has been a shift and, you know, there are more jobs now that are, you know, I know that there's job fairs for people who have been incarcerated and there are probably higher levels of hiring of people with criminal backgrounds and records. Shelby that- County government has hired over 150 Virginia, do you have any advice for our listening audience about things that might help accelerate relational trust in their daily you know, interactions with other people? One thing that comes to mind is I, I think that part of what happens is our world is so hurried and frenzied and busy. And so we we don't slow things down enough to actually like. Like you said, like say hello to people, like like actually communicate um, and 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 ask, see and be seen questions. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> you know, like and 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 re- really consider the intent when you're asking a question because sometimes we're moving so fast, like how you doing, you know, and and you're not actually maybe really wanting to know <laughs> how are you doing, <laughs> you know. So sometimes there has to be like no. How are you really doing? And I mean, and I think that there's a lot that we can do within the organizations and businesses that we lead to make sure that we're tending our culture in a way that allows for the human beings that, you know, work together to to have the space to be able to share. Um, I'm curious about. What I'm hearing a lot of is the shared humanity, something that the arts helps illuminate for individuals, no matter your walk of life, is empathy and shared humanity. That's why a lot of people come. It brings people from all walks of life together to sit in an audience and have an experience. And it through that, you take away something to then go and be activated. And in the reentry process, that's something that previously was so lacking was the presence of the shared humanity being brought to the forefront, the reminder that we all deserve respect, honor, and that we are all worthy. At what stage does it go from being like logistical reentry to like working on the holistic side of the human being, or is it all one and the same? For me, it's always been that reentry okay. doesn't exist when you just focus on one thing. You have to take a person and live life with them. Mm-hmm. So the way lifeline is structured, classes um, generally from 9 to 11, 12 o'clock every day. And then we had contract work so they could go out and make a living. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you couldn't go to work unless you came to class because class is more important. And you didn't get paid for class. Class was what you did as your investment in yourself. And in class, we talked about 
not just what was in our books, but real life situations. What happened last night? What happened at work yesterday? And we made it consumable because it's one thing to have information for individuals, but they have to be able to consume it. So when it comes from a leader that understands why you did it in the first place and knows you well enough to talk to you in a way you can consume, but also can broaden the conversation so other people can learn while one person is being taught, that changes the dynamic of it and you become a family. And one of our phrases is one band, one sound. Lifeline is a family of individuals. No matter where you come from, we come together every day. And when we were in class, we have a creed we would recite. The purpose of the creed is not just to say things that affirm who you are, but it unifies them and they don't know it. No matter what happens, no matter how bad class was, because we had real life conversations where sometimes it would lead to people wanting to fight. But you know, when you know how to navigate that, it you, sometimes I would want that. Mm-hmm. You need sometimes to have people get shaken up, get to a place where they think they can't come down from. Then they come down. Now you use that the next time they get mad. You did it yesterday. So you can do it today. And they've learned. Don't even know they've learned. But in, in doing that, and then after all of that tension and all that frustration, now we're going to say decree. And they say decree with everything in them. And when they leave, whatever happened, it's pretty much brushed aside because we have relationships. D- this doesn't work without relationships. This work cannot be transactional. It can't be sitting down, checking a box, and then I met this requirement, I met that requirement. Okay, they're done. That doesn't happen. And you have to be able to be found. What do you mean? Because our people don't get in trouble between 8 and 430. They don't have bad decisions during the sun. And most time it's not during daytime. It's after the, 2 o'clock in the morning. Can they call you or somebody that you've assigned to assist them at that moment to just talk them down? Yeah. Well, generally when people are angry, and they, mm-hmm. they don't call people It's going to calm them down. They call people that's going to keep them angry mm-hmm. because your anger, if left alone, will subside. So with technology. You add more fuel. Indeed. You want, yeah. So when I begin to calm down, I must call someone that says, oh, yeah, where they at? Let's go get them. But if they call me and I say, calm, they don't want to call me because I'm going to say, no, let's, let's breathe. I don't want to breathe. I want to kill them. <laughs> so they call somebody that wants to keep telling them to kill them. Mm-hmm. So we have to teach them that that's not the best option. How do you use me as an excuse? How do you have people that learn the same thing you learn so you can call them since you trust them and they can bring you down? And last thing I'll say, in our organization, we define trust because it's all rooted in trust. It's giving someone the ability and permission to hurt you. We must trust each other. You must give people in this room the ability and permission to harm you. I don't mean harm you physically, but being vulnerable enough that if they were to say a thing that you've repeated, that you've already stated, it could probably hurt your feelings. Are you willing to trust the next person in this room with that? And if you can get to a place where we can trust each other, there's nothing that people can do to stop us because we already know each other's dirty business. You know, we're, we're already unified. And the mission now is let's prove them wrong. They're not going to be right about us. We're going to be different. And it works. In the same vein of the one band, one sound, um, what do we as a community have to gain by investing in the reentry process? A safe environment. The reason we have so much violence and crime in our community right now is some of our people just don't feel like they belong in the economy. They feel like outcasts, that no one is really invested in them. If we want to reduce crime, we're going to have to intentionally engage in people that are doing bad things. And everyone is not equipped to do that. So support people that not only are equipped to do it, but have a desire. If you want to be a part, support people that are doing the work, learn how to do it effectively, and then jump in. Because your lived experience is valuable, but you have to know how to apply it. Your lived experience in in an isolated incident doesn't train. But your lived experience in a place where someone can make it consumable gives gives a person an opportunity to learn how to deal with situations, not because you're so smart, but because you're different and there's power and differences if used correctly. I love that. Um, Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk to you, DeAndre, about the exciting grant that Lifeline for Success got from the U.S. Department of Justice. Can you share a little more about that? Yes, thank God. Yes, so we have um, finished the home. We did a TV show with Mary Beth Conley called Flip My Life, and it's about the, the reconstruction of this home that was donated to us and uh, the lives of individuals that are justice involved. It's a cross-section of different community organizations and different people that are walking the walk. And the purpose of the grant is is to support the operations of this home. So we have a new space. It'll be, matter of fact, I'll get to see my reveal of it tomorrow. I'll get to see it for the first time tomorrow because it's part of the TV show. And uh, six people have a place to live because we know this. Many people go back to environments that are toxic. So take them out for the day, train them, and then send them home, 
you get them dirty again. They have to clean them up every day. I wanted a place where they could be what's away from the toxicity, where they can truly heal what prison's supposed to do, but doesn't do very well in a way that's not forced, but voluntary. So they have a place to live, the training they need, opportunities for employment, a loving environment. And now we've created a safe space for people to heal. And once they're healed, they become another positive, productive citizen. You do that over and over again, and you have a ripple effect because they do have family and friends. They still look up to them and they have influence that can then be an ambassador for the work and then create change in their family and their friendships and in anyone that comes in contact with them because they have the courage now and the ability to affect change. DeAndre, I'm, I'm curious, in addition to this great work that's happening with this new facility, what are some of the innovations that are happening in Lifeline for Success and the work that you're doing that you're excited about? I think just the opportunity to provide a safe space. I mean, that is huge. And it's not just a safe space. It's a brand new space. Because when people walk in, they'll realize that someone cared enough about them. Uh, and many of the guys that will live there had a hand in the rebuild. So uh, to, to be able to point at a space they live and to take pictures and share with the, their families that I'm doing something different and look at my work, it's tangible. Uh, it's it just that new, that, that, that hope. Because most of the time, the work <laughs> is, is, is given in places uh, that aren't of the highest quality. Uh, we deal with a population of people that most people don't want to help. Their mindset is they shouldn't have done it. They should be punished. And let's hope they get as punished to the fullest extent that they can and they suffer. So when you when you know that that's the, the background or the foundation of people's uh, view of the, of the work, uh, to have something that's completely opposite, brand new. Because they'll <laughs> to think of it this way. These men will live in a home that looks better than mine. And it's like, you know, like, yeah, I may want to spend the night. There's a, a lot of hope in, in the work that you're doing, um, DeAndre, and, and I, I can just I wish I, you could see the, the light on his face in this conversation. And so, Virginia, I want to turn the hope conversation to you. What, what about the future of your work brings you hope? So I, I, I think for a long time, Playback uh, Memphis's work has it, it's felt like it's lived in this like one of the best kept secrets in Memphis um, and that people haven't. Um, fully understood the power of the arts to be a healing force in really casting a vision for a new narrative in our city. And I feel like that, you know, with everything that DeAndre just said about how there has been a shift and um, and a and a focus that really invites um, individual community members, citizens to think about like, what's my part in this story? And what I love about Playback's work is that it meets, it meets everyone and invites them into, you know, as a space where you're listening to um, the stories of one another and whether it's somebody that's, you know, been incarcerated or somebody who's been impacted by, um, the harm that crime can cause and, and, and realizing that we're all part of this human story together and that we all have a role in um, building the kind of culture that we need. Um, and that culture includes empathy and it includes accountability and it includes, um, you know, just the, the capacity for uh, listening. And I think that the, we're in a in a stage of our work where we're building some really exciting new partnerships and, and partners who are really understanding that applying playback in this way to support whether it's workforce development or mental health counselors and being able to do their work more effectively, that these, you know, community based, culturally responsive, embodied, transformative tools that have been in our toolbox for a while, people now rather than seeing them as some sort of kind of weird oddity are, are recognizing, oh, we need those tools. And so we're just excited to be able to have, you know, new partnerships and new opportunities and ways to apply them to, um, you know, build the life affirming culture that we all need to flourish. And so that's what I'm excited about. What do you think has made the difference for each of you in kind of that shift in the narrative in your respective work and in the work together with the arts and the reentry process. I'm curious if you've noticed anything as specific 
contributors to the kind of general narrative, one, about reentry, and two, about the arts as this really important tool to every kind of conversation in what do you think is contributing to that kind of narrative shift? Well, I think the the convergence of, I mean, there's a lot of research now in sort of neuroscience and the ways in which, I mean, I think what going through the pandemic, mm. now everyone really has kind of a visceral understanding to a degree of the impact of trauma. And so people had kind of their own lived experience with that. Um, and, and I think it um, created the space for people to consider, you know, how, how we were going to collectively heal from that. And I think that, that the arts became a part of that in moving us, you know, into uh, where we are now. Uh, remember I told you I, I started my criminal behavior and I tried to sell crack for a little while. And when crack was out, uh, you saw adults, grown people walking around like zombies two or three o'clock in the morning. It was, it was horrible, but it was mostly an African-American community. Then opioids came and the same effects that crack had on the Afri- African-American community. I went across the street and these, the children, excuse me, the individuals that were faced with that battle ended up in court. And it looked different to see that individual there. So there had to be a reason that this person is before a judge. Uh, and since they had to have a reason, they went back and found out most of the time it was attributed to an opioid addiction. So in order to fight crime now, let's treat people. Let's help people. Because these aren't bad people. These are people that have stumbled upon an addiction and they need help. And you can't do that for one group of people without doing it for all people. And what has happened now is, is since you don't know who will be next, people are, are uh, leaning on the side of caution and putting things in place now like drug court. There's no drug court for crack. Yeah. But now there's a drug court. You can go to court every day or however often the judge wants to see you. And as long as you follow those rules, you don't go to prison. I was incarcerated with a guy in my, during my federal time who had, had, had his first conviction, had a few rocks of crack cocaine, and he got eight years of federal prison at 85%. How is that fair? And I was also incarcerated with the white guy who was selling meth. I'd been to prison three times and was given probation going home. This was 15 years ago. No, excuse me, eight, 20 years ago. I apologize. That was 20 years ago. But over time, you see it's shifting now. Uh, and and I, I just want to make sure I lift that up. Virginia, can you explain a little bit about how playback theater as a process assists individuals in having potentially high conflict conversations? Yeah. So I think that first and foremost, it doesn't start with how are we going to quickly get to a high conflict conversation because you're not (laughs) and you're not going to do that successfully. So it starts with, you know, how do you create a space where people can see one another's humanity first? And we use a lot of, um, of play and we use a lot of, um, tools from mindful listening we use a lot of story sharing exercises. Uh, and so I, we, we getting to a, a place where you can have a conversation about something that you're identifying as like high conflict, mm-hmm. you're going to do so much work <laughs> first to build relational trust. Because if you don't have relational trust, Right. And you try to have a high conflict conversation, that's going wrong fast. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like y- y- you have to make that in- investment. And that does uh, playback facilitates that by creating a space where that's your intention to come to kind of know one another as human beings. That's like, what do you care about? What do you value? What do you dream of? Like, 
you know, what do you remember from when you were five years old when someone, you know, expressed kindness and compassion and generosity to you? And how did that make you? So there's a lot that we're doing that's um, that's that's really tending to building human connection and trust and um, and supporting people and growing their self-awareness and perspective taking so that then when you you do introduce things it's no longer a high conflict like, even if it's a touchy subject even if it's, it's a touchy subject okay. no then then you have this level of trust and connection that you can actually you know it can you can have your lens and i can have mine but i care about you i know you beyond some you know, ideology or opinion or some issue that we're hot about. And not that people, you know, people are passionate about issues and we should be able to exchange our perspectives and ideas and thoughts. Um, DeAndre, one final question. Um, for individuals in our city and our community who might still be kind of fearful of the unknown when it comes to working with justice-involved individuals. Do you have any advice other than to remember the humanity of us all? We have to always remember that God didn't create bad people. Some people, sometimes through no uh, fault of their own, have put in situations where they made bad decisions. One of the things I try to tell people is never judge a person on a decision that they make until you first examine their options. Because there were some people that didn't have options that were positive. They grew up in situations where every option in the normal society was a bad option, mm -hmm. but they took the lesser of the evils and attempted to build a life from that. And in doing so, may have stayed in that path for too long. Mm -hmm. But when they're ready to change, we have to be willing to assist people in change. I don't, mm. I never understood why we will assist a person that is addicted to opioids through rehabilitation. And when they have overcome the addiction or can manage it, they're fully restored. No one brings it up. But if a person steals in Tennessee over a thousand dollars worth of goods or services, they are labeled a convicted felon and it follows them for the rest of their lives. HIPAA laws won't even allow you to share that a person has an addiction. But society shares readily, easily uh, when people have convictions. You can lick my name up right now mm -hmm. and know that I have state and federal convictions. But if I had an addiction, you could not have a database to show you that I was once addicted to a drug. That alone says that it was intentional to keep people out of society. How do we as a society fight that? and fix it so all people have value. Thank you for, you know, helping us better understand the perspectives there and the inequities that are just in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, for anyone in need of your services, how can they get connected with you? At Lifeline to Success, the number is 901-729-6537 or www.lifeline, the number two, success.org but if you need the Shelby County Office of Reentry that's at 1362 Mississippi Boulevard 901-222-4550 or at Shelby County off excuse me scofficeofreentry.com and Virginia how can folks get in touch with you how can they support the work that you're doing with playback yeah so um we have an upcoming Memphis Matters performance that's our public performance on December 2nd at Theater South, and you can uh, find more information at playbackmemphis.org, but that's always a wonderful place to be introduced to Playback Theater. And uh, yeah, any we're, as I said, um, eager to share uh, our resources um, and to be a greater resource in the community. So uh, any organization that is looking to, um, thinking that they could benefit from applying playback in some way to catalyze growth, healing, or flourishing um, within their institution, we'd love to have a conversation.
And you can always donate to support nonprofits because that's something every nonprofit leader should be saying when they yes. have the opportunity. So I'll say it. Yeah. Everybody in the room yeah. e- echoes that sentiment. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> right. right. And for folks who do want to support you, yeah. right back at your website? Yes. Yes. Great. Absolutely. Play Same for Lifeline. Same for Lifeline. All right. Well, thank you both so much for the work that you were doing to help us build a better, more empathetic and communal community. Um, We're so grateful for your time today and appreciate the conversation. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. Independent Bank is celebrating 25 years of sharing your stories, building your dreams and serving you heroically. Find out how iBank can help you achieve your financial dreams at i-bankonline.com. Member FDIC.